Shalom. I'm Eddie Chumney from Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to this week's Focus Israel Report. In this week's report, I'm going to be sharing with you the results of Benjamin Netanyahu's effort to form his new government coalition and an analysis of its prophetic significance. Benjamin Netanyahu made an agreement to establish his new government coalition on March the 15th. Initially, the centrist secular party Yesh Atid, which means there's a future, headed by its leader Yair Lapid, wanted to be in charge of the foreign ministry. The current Israeli foreign minister is Evigdort Lieberman. He heads the political party Israel Batenu, which means Israel our home. In December, Lieberman was accused of illegal activities. He has not been criminally charged. In the January 22nd Israeli elections, Likud, the party of Benjamin Netanyahu, ran on a joint party list with Israel Batenu, the party of Evigdor Lieberman, as part of their agreement for their parties to run together in the elections. Netanyahu promised Lieberman that if he was cleared of the charges against him, that he would remain as foreign minister. Netanyahu promised Lieberman to hold his cabinet position pending the outcome of the investigation against him. Therefore, Netanyahu refused to offer the foreign ministry position to Yeshatid. At the beginning of the past week's negotiations, there was a deadlock between the Likud negotiators, which is the party of Benjamin Netanyahu, and the centrist secular party of Yeshatid, which means there's a future, headed by its leader Yair Lapid, and the modern orthodox nationalistic party of Jewish home, headed by its leader Naftali Bennett, over the issue of who would be in control of the interior, finance, and education ministries. Initially, Yeshatid wanted to head both the interior and education ministries. Jewish Home wanted to be in charge of the finance ministry. However, Netanyahu wanted to retain for his Likud party both the interior and education ministries. In response to the high demands of Yeshatid to be included in Netanyahu's government, Netanyahu responded by saying that he would conduct negotiations with the ultra-Orthodox parties Shaz, which is the Sephardic ultra-Orthodox party, and United Torah Judaism, which is the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox party, to have them join his government instead of Yeshatid. However, even if Netanyahu would have been able to do this, he still needed the Labor Party of Shelley Yakimovich to join the coalition, as he would not yet have the majority of 61 Knesset seats to be able to form a government if only the ultra-Orthodox parties joined his government. In the last several weeks of negotiations, the Labour Party and Shelly Yakimovich has been adamant that they will not join Netanyahu's government. Therefore, in further negotiations between the parties, a compromise was reached whereby if Yeshatid leader Yair Lapid would give up his desire for the interior ministry, that Likud would agree to give Yeshatid control of the education ministry, allowing Yeshatid's second in command, Rabbi Shea Piron, to head the education ministry. In talks with Jewish Homes Naftali Bennett, Yair Lapid agreed to become the finance minister. Jewish Home agreeing that instead of being in charge of the finance ministry, they would lead other socio-economic ministries within the government. One of the major campaign issues for both Yeshatid and Jewish Home was wanting ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students to enlist in the Israeli military. An agreement was made between Yeshatid and Jewish Home on a policy concerning the issue. During the elections, Yeshatid called for the number of government officials serving in the Israeli cabinet to be reduced from the current 30 to 18. In forming the new government, Yeshatid agreed that there would be either 21 or 22 cabinet members. The parties also agreed to raise the threshold for representation in the Israeli Knesset from the current 2% to 4% in the next Israeli elections. The new criteria of 4% would mean that in the next Israeli elections, no political party could be elected without having fewer than five Knesset seats. Of the current parties in the Israeli Knesset, three Arab parties would not meet the minimum requirement. Neither would the Jewish party of Kadima, that is now headed by Shaul Mofaz. 
Further reforms in the government include now needing a majority of 65 Knesset members in the next election to be able to topple the current government in power instead of the present majority of 61 voting in favor to do so. The new government coalition agreement was signed by Yeshatid and Jewish Home on Friday, March the 15th. In forming the new government, Netanyahu made the following statement. The new government will work together in full cooperation for the benefit of the entire Israeli public. We will act to strengthen the state of Israel's security and to improve the quality of life of its citizens. Jewish home leader Naftali Bennett released his own statement regarding the new government agreement saying, With God's help, we did it. The 33rd Israeli government is ready to go. I encourage Prime Minister Netanyahu and all the cabinet ministers to remember that we are representatives of the entire Israeli public. We promise during elections to take care of the cost of living, to increase competition in the marketplace, and to restore the Jewish soul of Israel. And now we have the means to do it. One of the major issues to Netanyahu being able to form a government was the drafting of ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students into the Israeli military. This is because the ultra-Orthodox parties, Shahs and United Torah Judaism, wanted to maintain the status quo. Because of the differences in opinion over this matter between the ultra-Orthodox parties and Yeshatid and Jewish home, it became not possible for Yeshatid and Jewish home to serve in the same government as the ultra-Orthodox parties. In their election campaigns, Yeshatid and Jewish home insisted that ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students serve in the Israeli military. Yeshatid wanted to place more stricter requirements upon the ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students than did Jewish home. A compromise was worked out between them over the issue. A ministerial committee headed by Yeshatid will submit a bill in the Knesset within 45 days after the establishment of the new government that will ultimately draft ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students in to the Israeli military. The outline of the coalition agreement on this issue is as follows. The drafting of ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students into the Israeli military will begin at the age of 21 instead of the age of 18, which is the age for the Israeli public in general. This gives ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students an additional three years of deferment into the Israeli military. Then they will serve for two years. Those who do not enlist will not face criminal charges, but will be prohibited from leaving the country and won't be eligible for welfare and tax benefits including social security payments for large families, among other penalties that they would incur. In addition, religious educational institutions that encourage their students to dodge the draft, like some ultra-Orthodox yeshivas, will face a significant reduction in state funding if they do so. The number of yeshiva students who will be exempted from joining the Israeli military so that they can engage in full-time Torah study will be 1,800. Yeshatid had originally requested that this number be 400. This plan will take effect only in 2017, and students who are beyond enlistment age up until that time will not be grandfathered into the arrangement. The new government will also implement economic measures aimed at encouraging the ultra-Orthodox to join the workforce. The ultra-Orthodox parties claimed that the new proposed laws to draft ultra-Orthodox yeshiva students into the Israeli military are an attack against Torah and Judaism. As a result, the new government coalition agreement states, The state of Israel recognizes the importance and centrality of Torah study as a central value of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. The coalition agreement will also require that so-called core subjects, including math, science, and English, will be taught in all Israeli schools within two and a half years. These subjects have not been taught in the ultra-Orthodox schools. Finally, the new coalition agreement will call for the resumption of peace talks with the Palestinians and increasing financial support for Holocaust survivors. Some of the key government positions agreed upon by the parties include the following. Israel Batenu leader Ivigdor Lieberman, assuming he's not indicted for criminal activities, will keep his position of foreign minister. Yair Lapid, the leader of Yeshatid, will be the finance minister. And the second person on the Yeshatid list, Rabbi Shea Peron, will be the minister of education. Jewish home leader Naftali Bennett will be the minister of economics and trade, as well as overseeing issues regarding the diaspora in Jerusalem. Jewish home will also oversee the housing and construction ministry, along with the Israeli lands administration, 
as well as being in charge of the Religious Affairs Office. Zippy Livni will be in charge of peace talks with the Palestinians. So Netanyahu's new government will comprise four political parties in Israel. The Joint Party of Likud Batenu, who has 31 seats, Yeshatid, 19, Jewish Home, 12, and the party of Zippy Livni Hatnua, or the Movement, 6. This will give a total of 68 members in the government of the 120 members in the Israeli Knesset. Given that the ultra-Orthodox party, Shahs and United Torah Judaism, have had a monopoly over Jewish religious affairs in Israel in the history of the modern nation since its establishment in 1948, not being in the new government and thus being able to control those ministries which operate and control religious issues, this is a huge political earthquake in Israel that will shape the future course of the country in its prophetic future. Jewish home represents a modern orthodox religious zionist movement the religious zionist movement has always embraced the land of israel as the covenant land promised to abraham isaac and jacob therefore they've been active in settling the land and many religious zionist jews comprise those jews who are living in the west bank the ultra-orthodox parties are less concerned with settling the land and are more concerned with studying the Talmud all day in the ultra-Orthodox yeshivas. Because of the strict way that the ultra-Orthodox have sought to govern religious affairs and practices in Israel, this has caused many non-Orthodox Jews in Israel to resent them, despising many of the policies that they've put in place over the years regarding marriage, divorce, and applying Jewish law or the rulings of the rabbis in rabbinic Judaism to Israeli society. While this resentment has been building up over the years, it has now become a political issue in this election through the voices of Yeshatid and Jewish Home. And because they are now in power in the current government, they have pledged to change the status quo regarding religious matters in Israel. The fallout from this in the way in which the ultra-Orthodox responds has huge prophetic implications. So how will that ultimately play out in the months and years ahead? Only time will tell. So what does the new Israeli government mean for the peace process? The modern Orthodox Religious Zionist Nationalistic Party of Jewish Home is now a member of Netanyahu's government. Among the government positions of Jewish Home is in charge of housing, construction, and Israel land administration. Jewish Home is opposed to a settlement freeze in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. As a result, Jewish Home is not likely to agree to a settlement or a construction freeze. The Palestinian position is that they will not restart negotiations with Israel unless there is first a building freeze in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. This situation will likely cause the talks to remain in stalemate as it is unlikely that a common formula can be found to restart peace talks. In September of 2011, the Palestinians requested be recognized through the UN Security Council as a Palestinian state with 67 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. Since that time, the United States has blocked this request from being voted upon in the UN Security Council as they've threatened to veto the proposal, should it be voted upon on the floor. The Palestinians had their status upgraded at the UN to become a non-member state on November 29, 2012. If Israel and the Palestinians continue to not find common ground for restarting peace talks, the Palestinians are likely to make a demand upon Obama, which would most likely be something like this, that the United States needed to cancel their threat of veto for the Palestinians to be recognized as a state based upon 67 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital at the UN Security Council, or the Palestinians will take their case to the International Criminal Court. The showdown on this issue is likely to take place in the next three to six months. Until we do it again, Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen.